thank you, uh, Taft, for that introduction. It's a real honor for me to be here today. I'm going to tell you about the search for other Earths. Uh, but before I do so, there's a number of preliminaries that I need to get out of the way. And the first is for me to understand the audience a little bit better. There's going to be a few interactive portions of this lecture. So the first portion is um, uh, there will be a series of questions where you need to raise your hand. So the first question is, please raise your hand if you have ever been to a Keck astronomy lecture before. OK, that, that helps me set the stage. Please raise your hand if you are an amateur astronomer or someone else who's similarly technically inclined. OK. Uh, raise your hand if you work for Keck Observatory. OK. All right, the next little bit of preliminary uh, information I need to get out of the way is a reminder to please turn off the, uh, your cell phones, silence them. I'm going to be using three terms today interchangeably. We, in our solar system, of course, we have planets. It's a term we also use for planets orbiting other stars, which we call extrasolar planets, and sometimes we shorten it to uh, just exoplanets. And finally, my last little bit of preliminary uh, pre preamble here is that I'd like to thank the Keck Observatory, both for this opportunity to speak to you today and also for being a world-class facility that, that I can use in my research uh, to find other planets. My colleagues use it as well. I have been a user of many of the observatories on Mauna Kea, in Chile, in Arizona, elsewhere around the world, and I have to tell you that Keck really is the best. It's an extraordinary place. So thank you to the entire Keck staff for your dedication to making Keck a world-class observatory. My talk today is somewhat well-timed. You may have um, seen the news in the past few weeks. Um, my team's research was actually on the cover of the New York Times on two consecutive weeks. If you, uh, we didn't quite beat out the healthcare debacle, but we were, <laughs> were nevertheless, um, we were pleased to be on the front page. And there's two major results that I'd like to tell you about today. And these are our discovery of the first Earth-sized extrasolar planet that we think has the same density and composition as the Earth. We think it's made of rock. I'll tell you about that a little bit later. And we're also going to talk about the, the first measurement of uh, eta sub Earth for planets that are the same size as Earth and that are the same temperature of Earth. And you'll see that this is a, really a, a great synergy between the Kepler Space Telescope and Keck Observatory. But before uh, we go into those more recent stories, I have to go back a little bit farther and introduce uh, the maybe three or four of you in the audience who haven't been to these talks before to some of the basics. So here is uh, my favorite planet, the Earth. And we might ask some basic questions about the Earth and about other planets in our solar system and about other solar systems indeed. And here are three of the most interesting questions for me. And in some sense, these are really childish questions, but they're perhaps even profound questions. And they're really a connection between uh, the life on our planet and life elsewhere in the universe. So let me just read these questions. Number one, is our Earth common or rare? And maybe perhaps what makes our Earth special? How did our solar system form? We'd like to know if the processes which led to the development of the Earth and Jupiter and all the other uh, planets in our solar system, are they universal processes or are they part of some broad spectrum? Uh, and finally, what is that diversity of planetary systems? You'll see uh, pretty soon that uh, planetary systems are extraordinarily diverse. So until about 20 years ago, we had exactly one solar system that we could study. This was our own. Um, the, there's some interesting patterns in our solar system that we might ask if these patterns are repeated in other solar systems. The pattern that strikes me most is that there are four rocky planets orbiting close in, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These all have more or less the same composition. And as you go farther out, we have the gas giant planets, Saturn and Jupiter, and the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. So an open question is whether or not this architecture of a planetary system is a common one in the universe, or are there other architectures perhaps suggesting different formation histories? In order to study these other architectures and other planetary systems, we have to search for planets. So we could imagine pointing, our, pointing one of the Keck telescopes at 
perhaps this star, this star, this star, and we could ask the question, does that particular star have an exoplanet or an entire planetary system? And there's lots of ways you could imagine searching for these exoplanets. The first one, the, perhaps the, the most simplistic one, is to try to take a picture of an exoplanet. And for those of you who have attended previous Keck astronomy talks might know that this is a very challenging problem. If you think of a star as a, a, a lighthouse like the one shown here, the planet in comparison is like me standing at the base of the lighthouse with a lit match. There's an enormous contrast range between how bright the lighthouse is and how bright uh, the match is. This problem is made even worse by the fact that if we put this problem to scale, the lighthouse is in California and we're here in Hawaii, so the, the lighthouse and the match are almost right on top of each other and they have this enormous brightness contrast, something like a factor of 10 billion brightness contrast for the Earth uh, orbiting the sun. Nevertheless, um, people are trying and uh, Keck Observatory is indeed leading the way in this. And there have been some, some discoveries of image, so-called imaged extrasolar planets. Here I'll show this little animation of one. This is a, a star, not unlike the sun, actually a little bit heavier than the sun, HR 8799. And if you essentially blot out that star using a coronagraph, something that effectively just blocks the light of the star, you can imagine putting your thumb over the, the image of the star, there are four detected imaged planets orbiting this star, HR 8799. And these have been known for a handful of years now, and we've even detected orbital motion of the innermost planet. Um, I should mention that they were detected by Christian Marois using uh, the Keck uh, Observatory and also Gemini Observatory. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on imaged planets, um, in part because detecting imaged planets requires, at this point, kind of a trick. These particular planets and their host star are very young. They're only 30 million years old in comparison to the four and a half billion year old, uh, billion year age of our solar system. And because these planets formed so recently, they've retained a lot of their, the heat of their formation, making that the problem, the contrast problem I mentioned earlier of one in uh, 10 billion much easier, only something like one in 100,000. So we're, we're making progress imaging these planets, and I hope that one day I or someone else can come back and tell you about the imaged Earth-sized planets orbiting sun-like stars, but we're not, the air. we're not there yet. So we have to look for other techniques. And uh, in our effort to look for other techniques, maybe we should revisit our uh, basic physics. This, of course, is Isaac Newton, who among uh, his many lessons, he taught us that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that means that as a planet orbits its host star, of course, the motion of the planet is great, and we would like to detect the orbit of this planet to figure out how far away it is from the star, the amount of light it receives from the star. But you'll notice that the star itself has a small pirouette, which is a mirror image scaled down of the planet's orbit. So if we can find a way to detect the motion of this host star, then we can infer properties about the planet. In particular, the planet, the, the star's orbital period, how long it takes it to go in a circle, is exactly the same as the orbital period of the planet. And the amount of gravity that the planet tugs on the star with is proportional to the mass of the planet. So using the Doppler technique, which I'll describe in a moment, we can measure the periods of planets, we can measure their orbital architectures if the, if the orbits are elongated, and we can also measure the masses of the planets. So in order to, to do these Doppler measurements, um, there are only a handful of observatories in the world where you can make these measurements. I prefer to go to the Keck Observatory. And I'll show a very simplified version of a planet-finding spectrograph. I use a spectrograph called HiRes on, uh, on the Keck-1 telescope. And in this simplified version of the spectrograph, we have a collimated beam of light coming from the giant 10-meter Keck telescope it is dispersed into all of its component colors using a, a spectrometer. In this case, it's shown by a prism. There actually is a, um, really a prism inside uh, this high-res spectrometer. And then we simply look at the spectrum uh, that's dispersed by the spectrometer using a camera. The camera that we use in high-res, of course, is a tad more sophisticated than this digital camera that's shown here, but the principle is basically the same. 
And the spectra that we observe with the high-res instrument are really extraordinary and contain an enormous amount of information. This is the spectrum of a star somewhat like the sun. And I'll give you a little bit of a tour guide to reading uh, this spectrum. It runs from, uh, at the top, these are wavelengths that are just a little bit too red for your eyes to see, and these are the blue and ultraviolet wavelengths at the bottom. Th the spectrum wraps around like a ribbon, so as you go in decreasing wavelength, you have to read all the way across here, and then you come back to the other side and read again. You'll notice that there are dark bands. The dark bands correspond to absorption lines in the atmosphere of the host star, and this is the the hook, this is the anchor that we're going to use to detect the motion of the star. So as the planet orbits its host star, it causes the star to move. And this movement of the star we detect by the Doppler shift. This is the same uh, mechanism that causes uh, train whistles, which I realize in Hawaii is maybe not as apt of an analogy, but bear with me. Um, the same mechanism that causes the sound waves of train whistles to change their pitch depending on if the train is coming or going. Likewise, as the star is coming or going in its orbit, we see these stellar absorption lines shift ever so slightly to the left and shift ever so slightly to the right. And so we detect this teeny motion using CCD detectors. This is a zoom in on the t uh, one of these spectral lines. And you can see that this uh, spectral line is moving back and forth. This motion that's maybe something like a few tenths of a pixel, is actually a huge effect. The effect, the, the amplitude that we look for, um, typically a one meter per second signal, corresponds to a shift of one one thousandth of a pixel. So we have to detect very small shifts indeed. And we accomplish that by measuring this spectral line and averaging it with the thousands of spectral lines shown in this spectrum. So that's how we measure uh, Doppler shifts and infer the orbits of the planet. Now we can ask the question, what kind of planets can we actually find? So uh, prior to the discovery of the first planets orbiting uh, normal stars, there was a widespread expectation that basically we would find the solar system again. And in hindsight, this seems a little bit naive. We keep learning this lesson over and over again, that we, we think that we're the center, that the uh, Earth is the center of the universe, or maybe the sun is the center of the universe, or maybe the galaxy is the center of the universe, or maybe all planetary systems are made just like the only one we know. And so we looked basically for the largest planet in our solar system. We looked for Jupiter. The, the Doppler signal from Jupiter looks something like this. This is, I'm not going to have an enormous number of technical plots. This is the first technical plot in my talk. And what it shows is the Doppler velocity, how much the, planet, how much the planet is pulling on the star as a function of time. And you'll notice that time here is measured in years. This is something like 30 years all the way across. And from this set of measurements, which by the way would take, in, it's longer than a graduate student uh, PhD thesis, um, you can measure some pretty interesting things. So first of all, if the, if the uh, star is moving away from us, it has a positive radial velocity. If it's moving towards us, it has a negative radial velocity. It's blue shifted. From this plot, we can read off the orbital period, how long it takes the planet to go around its host star. Jupiter takes 12 years. We can also read off the planet mass by me measuring the amplitude of this displacement. This, and of course, this amplitude depends on other properties in the system, like the orbital period and like the mass of the star. So it's, it's rather amazing to me that we're over interstellar distances, we're measuring kind of human speeds. In this case, the Doppler motion of Jupiter is comparable to the fastest um, human running speed. So I mentioned before that we're gonna have some audience participation. This is uh, the second opportunity. So um, I'd like you, everyone in the audience, to take a look at this particular set of measurements. These are actual measurements. Um, of the Doppler effect, and ask yourself, what can we infer about the planet that's orbiting this particular star called 51 Pegasi? Can anybody find the pattern? There it is. So it's very fast, and notice that the horizontal axis is no longer measured in years, it's measured in days. Now, 
it's hard to surprise an audience with hot Jupiters anymore, but this is, at the time, this was really an extraordinary discovery. This particular planet, 51 Pegasi b, the first extrasolar planet around a normal star, it has an orbital period of only 4.2 days, and the mass of this planet is comparable to Jupiter. It's about half the mass of Jupiter. Um, it's in, in this, to be a little more precise, it's 0.45 Jupiter masses. So this discovery of the first hot Jupiter was one of the first humbling experiences in the new field of extrasolar planets. This planet uh, has a temperature something like 1,500 degrees Celsius. It has um, metals in its atmosphere. Uh, it has many uh, properties which, although it's this more or less the same size and the mass as Jupiter, that we don't observe on our, own, on our own Jupiter, which is much cooler. So I'm going to accelerate through the history of extrasolar planets by simply saying that after we detected Jupiters, there was great excitement. We, uh, I say we, mostly my forebears, discovered multiple planet systems, more than one Jupiter orbiting the same star. One of my favorite little anecdotes about this is that Deborah Fisher went to an elementary school classroom and talked about the two planets orbiting, I think it's Upsilon Andromeda, and they have masses of twice the mass of Jupiter and four times the mass of Jupiter. And so she asked the students, what do you think, we, these planets don't have names, what should we call them? And the, one of the students said, I think you should call them Tupiter and Forpiter. So, <laughs> so I, it's not official yet, but I'd rather like it. At any rate, I, dig, I digress from this history. Um, as, our, as our measurement precision has improved, we've been able to detect smaller and smaller planets, which impart smaller and smaller Doppler amplitudes on their host stars. And so the first discoveries of Saturn-sized planets, of planets the size of Uranus and Neptune were very big deals. And just in the last year have we been sensitive to planets that are the size of the Earth. And that's what I'm going to tell you, uh, what I'm going to spend most of my time telling you about. Now, one thing that strikes me about this family portrait of our solar system is that there seem to be archetypes of planets. Saturn and Jupiter, uh, more or less, are, are pretty similar. Uranus and Neptune, the same. The terrestrial planets also are self-similar. And you might ask, are these archetypes repeated, or are there perhaps intermediate planets, or planets that are total surprises um, and that are uh, foreign to our solar system? It turns out there are, and one of this, these new planet types are called the super-Earths. And these are planets that have sizes and masses intermediate between planets like the Earth and planets like Neptune or Uranus. Now, I have to say that super-Earth was kind of a marketing name. If these planets are probably not actually um, Earth, uh, scaled up versions of the Earth. In fact, it's a major research topic to figure out exactly what these planets are made out of. Some of them may be scaled down Neptunes. Some of them may have compositions essentially like a comet, half water and half rock. And that's, that, to me, that's pretty exciting to have a comet planet. So we've discovered new types of planets in addition to, measure, to detecting similar planets in our solar system. One of the other themes in exoplanet research is to try to do a census of planets to figure out how common planets of particular sizes or masses are. And this is a result uh, from my team and from 2010 from uh, measurements at Keck Observatory. And this was one of the first censuses of planets um, for planets all the way from Jupiter down all the way to these super Earth sized planets. At the time, we had to put a giant question mark in the Earth box, um, but now I think we have some more definitive uh, answers. So as we move to the era of Earths, we have to ask ourselves, are planets like the Earth common, or are they rare? One of the best uh, tools for discovering Earth-sized planets is the Kepler Space Telescope. The Kepler Space Telescope was launched uh, in 2009 in the spring. Um, and Kepler is really an extraordinary mission. It's a single-purpose mission. The Kepler Space Telescope, and st until a few months ago, unfortunately, um, stared at one patch of sky, 100 square degrees uh, in the, between the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. And these rectangles here show you the overlay of the CCD patterns on the sky. And Kepler was able to survey 150,000 stars simultaneously, minute after minute, while you were sleeping, while you were having breakfast, while you were driving to work, Kepler was taking measurements of these 150,000 stars. 
And over four years, it accumulated an extraordinary record of the brightness of each one of these stars over time. And it's through these brightness measurements that we're able to detect planets. Kepler uses a different um, planet detection mechanism than the one I described before, and this is the transiting planet uh, mechanism. Uh, transiting planets are planets that eclipse their host stars. They pass in front of the disk of the star as seen from the Earth, or more specifically, as seen by Kepler. And if you measure the brightness of the star, it's more or less constant. There's a little bit of noise, and then as the planet crosses the disk of the star, the brightness dips and it goes back to its original brightness as the planet is no longer eclipsing the star. So this gives us something to search for in the Kepler data. And Kepler's been really quite prolific at discovering these planets. So let me show you a little animation of, this is an artist's impression animation of what uh, the discovery of one planetary system in the Kepler data would look like. This is the Kepler 11 system. You can see it, it appears to be sort of pulsating and as we zoom in in this artist's impression, you can see that there are uh, six planets extremely closely packed, all orbiting the same star. Um, all of these, the, the inner five uh, orbits are extremely close and in, in a radius of something like the orbit of Mercury. Here's a, a little portrait of the Kepler-11 system. This was a Another artist's impression that was on the cover of Nature when these planets were announced, I think it was back in 2011. And what's amazing to me is that this is a situation that the Kepler telescope actually observed. Of course, we couldn't make out the disk of the, of the star and the disks of the planets, but there was one time in the Kepler photometry when all three planets were transiting simultaneously. So that's really quite a cosmic coincidence. Here's the footprint of the Kepler-11 system. One of the lessons from the Kepler telescope, and indeed from uh, the Doppler searches at Keck Observatory and elsewhere, is that there are an awful lot of planets orbiting really close to their host stars. And this is something that's foreign to our own planetary system. The Kepler-11 system is really kind of the extreme example. Six planets all inside the orbit of Venus, five of them inside the orbit of Mercury. So let me tell you about another of my favorite Kepler planetary systems, and this is another opportunity for audience participation. So what I'm showing here is a plot of the data from the, the actual data from the Kepler telescope. This is the brightness measurements of one particular star, which we call Kepler 10. And each one of these little circles corresponds to a brightness measurement of the star over a 30 minute interval. And you can see that uh, the horizontal axis extends almost one year. So I'll ask you, the audience, if you can see by eye the transiting planet signature in this light curve. <laughs> no? Uh, well, there, we have some lines to guide the eye. And so you can see that this particular planet with an orbital period of 45 days transits something like five or six times in this, uh, this sequence. Now, Kepler-10 is a, is a now a famous planetary system, and it's not famous for this particular planet having a period of 45 days. There's another planet in, the, in this system, and so if we zoom in on this little segment of data, you can see here's the one, the transit of that particular uh, planet having an orbital period of 45 days, but there's another transiting planet in this system, and it's extremely fast. It's this sort of comb-like spacing of data, I'll highlight this planet now, you can see that every 0.84 days, that's something like every 20 hours, this planet would pass in front of its star, causing the star to dim by just a little bit. And so if we take this long series of Kepler measurements and fold it, oops, excuse me, fold it one on top of another, a so-called phase folding plot, you can see that the discovery of Kepler 10b is really quite secure. This is the, uh, the phase folded light curve and as the planet passes in front of the star, it causes it to, causes it to dim by this very extremely teeny amount, only 150 parts per million. So Kepler-10 was a record-breaking planet in its day. Um, today it's, it's still an extraordinary planet. It has a, its size is 1.4 times that of Earth and as I said before, its orbital period is something like 0.8 days. Now more recently we've had 
uh, a transiting planet, which has um, elicited an enormous amount of excitement. And this, of course, was one of the reasons that I came to, you, to talk to you today. This is the planet Kepler-78b. And on, this planet goes around its star so quickly that it's very difficult to make out the individual transits as you could for the, the previous example. So I'm only showing you the phase-folded light curve. And you can see that this particular planet passes in front of its star. It has this sort of characteristic V-shaped light curve. That's simply because the Kepler data is averaging over 30-minute intervals. And then amazingly, as the planet um, passes behind the star, not in front of the star, there's a small dip in this light curve. The Kepler telescope receives less light from the system when the planet is behind its star. And this is because the planet itself is hot and is reflecting light from the star. So when it goes behind, it, the, the overall brightness of the system goes down. Now amazingly, if we, if we zoom in on this little region here, that's what this bottom panel shows down here, you can actually make out the phases of this planet that are analogous to the phases of the moon, the phases of Mercury. This, this planet, um, as it, when it transits its host star, that's right here, and this, at this instant, the planet is basically right in front, right in a line between us and the, and the host star. And then as it goes around the host star, we see the different phases of the planet, and the planet brightens. This is the, what you might call the full planet phase of the orbit, equivalent to the full moon. And then, of course, we see this so-called secondary eclipse, this dimming, and the pattern repeats over and over and over again. So one of the things that I especially like about this planet is that after it was discovered um, by Roberto Sanchez Ojeda, who's shown here, he's a graduate student at MIT, I was talking to my son, who's five, about this planet and some of his friends in the backyard. And one of the, the kids, who's 10, he said, he thought about it for a second, he said, you know, that'd be awesome, because I would have had 10,000 birthdays on that planet already. <laughs> That's a lot of presents. So <laughs> this extremely short orbital period really highlights how unusual this particular planet is. And when this planet was announced in the spring of this year by Roberto, we immediately knew that this was our best opportunity to measure the mass of a planet that's the size of the Earth. And I'm, it's on the screen, but I don't think I've said it out loud. This planet is 1.2 times the size of Earth. Practically speaking, it's the same size as Earth. Jupiter is about 11 times the size of the Earth, so this is extremely similar. So we decided that we wanted to make a measurement of the mass of this planet. Um, this planet is, although we think it's uh, the same size as the Earth, the same diameter, the same radius, we weren't sure what it was made out of. And nature has thrown so many curveballs at us. We've had so many surprises in exoplanets that we weren't sure if it was made of rock and a, a little bit of iron as our Earth is. It might be a planet that's pure iron. It might be, who knows, some exotic composition that we would be surprised to find out. But fortunately, if, since we knew the size of this planet very precisely, if we could measure the mass, then we could infer what the density of the planet is. And the, the densities of the planets in our own solar system varies significantly. If you know the density of a planet in our solar system, essentially you know its composition. Just to be a little bit quantitative, the terrestrial planets like Earth and Venus have densities of about five grams per cubic centimeter. The giant planets have densities of about one gram per cubic centimeter. And so if we could measure the mass, we could figure out what this thing is made out of. So to measure the mass, of course, we went to our favorite uh, observatory, the Keck Observatory, and we stared at this particular planet, this particular star, Kepler 78, for eight nights. Um, we looked at it all night, on each of these eight nights, and the Keck telescope, and this, I really like this video, um, we stayed on this planet all night long for eight, eight nights. And what's amazing is that since the orbital period is only eight and a half hours, we could watch a full year on this planet in a single night of observing. It's kind of a big, it's a great bang for your buck. Um, and so let me show you the data that I think, well, are really quite precious to me, and I think you'll maybe find them at least interesting. So this is a plot showing the, our so-called radio velocity measurements, just like the ones that I showed earlier, as a function of time. And each of the eight nights are highlighted in blue. And you can see that this spans something like a month. 
And you can maybe even sense some, you can make some psychological interpretations from this plot. We had one night where we made this measurement and then we kind of had to think about it for a few weeks if we really wanted to do this because it was an extraordinary investment. And then we decided to go for it and on seven additional nights we measured the velocity of this star. Now the axis is scrunched up so you can't actually see uh, this particular plot. The velocities go up and down for the planet. But if we subtract off this large scale variation, the, the, red, the giant red ripples, this is due to a kind of annoying feature of this particular star. It turns out this star has a lot of star spots which are analogous to sunspots. And they cause these false Doppler shifts. Fortunately we can get rid of these Doppler shifts and I'd be happy to explain how we do that in the question and answer period. But if we take off that large signal, here's what our data look like. This is the orbit of this planet, Kepler 78b, phased to its orbital period. And the measurements are consistently low when they're supposed to be low, when the planet is on one side of its star. And they're consistently high when they're supposed to be high. And you might say, well, maybe we've just jiggered the, the timing and the phasing to make it look, look right. There's a lot of different ways you could phase this up. The Kepler telescope measured the period of this planet with extraordinary precision. Kepler, no, Kepler measured the precision with uh, something like six milliseconds. So we know exactly where this planet is all the time. And all, our only job was to measure how much um, higher this clump of points was than this clump of points. And if we bin the data to make it look a little bit prettier, that's what this plot here shows, we have a clear detection of, the, of this planet using the Doppler technique at Keck Observatory. And it matches up exactly with what we see in the Kepler data. And so if we put Kepler 78b on one of my favorite plots in the field of extrasolar planets, this is the so-called mass radius diagram. And this is two views of the same data. On the vertical axis, this is planet size measured in, in planet radii. The Earth radius is down here. Jupiters are up here. And you can see that, excuse me, there's this huge population of planets up here that are many of which are even bigger than Jupiter. These are the so-called hot Jupiters that we started talking about at the very beginning. And they're especially easy to detect. They stick out like sore thumbs. So they, they overpopulate a diagram like this. But as you go to smaller and smaller planets following the green points here, which are the planets of the solar system, we get closer and closer to the Earth and to Venus. And if you look in this rectangular region here, which is blown up on the panel on the right, you can see that in the last several years, we've made great progress measuring the masses and radii of all these planets. Kepler 78b is the closest planet to date to this region of the Earth and of Venus. And you can see that it's right here. Earth and Venus are practically next door. Um, this planet has properties which make it very similar to the Earth. In particular, you'll notice that I've drawn in these theoretical contours in this mass radius space the green Earth-like line is a uh, composition contour of about two-thirds rock and one-third iron. A planet that's like Mercury that's 60% um, iron is a little bit denser and therefore has a higher mass for a given radius. And that's what this Mercury-like line is. Now you'll notice that Kepler 78b sits pretty well on top of the green line. And this is what gives us confidence that this planet has a composition that's very similar to the Earth. It's probably made of a large uh, amount of rock, just like the Earth. So now we'll move away from the technical plots to the artist's impressions, which I think are always fun. Um, this planet generated an enormous amount of publicity, and um, it was, it was a, a, a paper in the journal Nature. This is an artist's impression by Karen Taramura, who's the graphic artist at the Institute for Astronomy, where I work. And you can get a sense for how hellish of a world this planet Kepler 78b is. Um, in this impression, it's basically a lava world. And the backside of the planet, which probably stays perpetually dark because this planet is likely tidally locked to its host star, just like the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, one side always facing the star. Nevertheless, there's enough heat on this planet which is something like 3,000 to 5,000 degrees, that you would have active volcanoes and probably uh, enormous amounts of lava on the surface of this planet. So what's 
really special to me, and maybe even, you might say, spiritual to me, is that this lava world, the first planet that is the, the size of the Earth, that is made of rock, just like the Earth, was discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, but then we made this crucial measurement of the mass on a telescope that sits on the top of a rocky planet on a now cooled lava volcano. So that's really an, an impressive symmetry to me. So this, that's one of my favorite planets, um, but let me tell you a little bit about what else the Kepler Space Telescope has told us. Um, Kepler's done an enormous amount for extrasolar planets. We've now made a, a really spectacular census of planets, and we know how common planets are intrinsically, not just how commonly Kepler detects them, as a function of the planet's size, as a function of how far away the planets are from their host star. And this, to me, is at least astrophysically, is one of the most interesting representations of that census. This shows how common planets are as a function of their size. So this is the fraction of stars with a planet um, in a particular, having a particular size. And you can see it goes up to something like 10%. And this is only for the very close in orbits. We're not talking about Earth-like orbits here. And we can go all the way down to planets that are the size of the Earth. Jupiter is something like right here. And this shows us that planets that are something like two to three times the size of the Earth, all the way to the size of the Earth, these are the most common planets in the universe. And amazingly, the solar system does not have a planet that's represented on this plot. We're only looking at extremely close-in planets. And furthermore, the solar system does not have a planet that's two or three times the radius of the Earth. Neptune and Uranus are more like four times the radius of the Earth. So this shows a tremendous diversity of extrasolar planetary systems. Another lesson that we've learned from Kepler is that um, systems of multiple planets are common. I showed you earlier the animation of Kep the Kepler-11 system. It's sort of the poster child for this, uh, these, these multi-planet systems. These systems are characterized by being extremely flat. If you lined up all of the orbits in the Kepler-11 system, they're flatter than a phonograph record. The orbits in our solar system are tilted by a few degrees. So these sort of multi-planet systems make for interesting planetary science, but also for interesting visualization. Many of you are probably familiar with an orrery. This is a mechanical device that has a whole, an elaborate set of gears and little marbles on top corresponding to the sun in the center and the various planets, and the planets orbit the sun at speeds that are proportional to their actual orbits. And so when you turn the crank, these, this whole thing starts whirling around. So one of my colleagues, Dan Fabricke, has created what he calls the Kepler orrery. This is all of the multi-planet systems that have been discovered by Kepler. So these are systems where you have one star and you have more than one planet transiting the same star. And so each one of these shows, the star itself is not shown. Let me find one to uh, show you as an example. Here, we'll look at this system right here. The star would be in the center, and this one has two planets, the red one right here, and this sort of white, uh, yellowish one uh, a little bit farther away. The planet sizes are proportional to the size of the circle, and what's amazing is that you can animate this diagram. And, and it's, just, it's just amazing, the level of diversity and the fact that this great cosmic dance is happening all the time while we, we're not even aware of it, and the Kepler telescope has shown us uh, the orbits of all of these planets. So this will go for a few more seconds, I'll let it play out. <laughs> anyway, it's on YouTube if you want to find it. Okay, so what have we learned from Kepler? This is to synopsize a little bit here. We've learned that small planets are common. We've learned that, that planets are gregarious. They're commonly found in these multi-planet systems. We didn't talk about it in detail, but I'll just tell you that planet, these, most of the planets discovered by Kepler have low so-called orbital eccentricities. This means that their orbits are much more circular than elongated. Um, and many of the planets discovered by Kepler are in these flat systems where they're all in the, orbiting in the same plane. And this is all fine uh, and good, but Kepler was a mission that was launched to discover planets like the Earth. 
the goal of the Kepler mission was to measure Aedes of Earth, how common planets the size of Earth, the temperature of Earth, are around sun, uh, stars like the sun. So let's try to answer that question, and this is the second major result uh, that I'm here to tell you about today. So I'll start off by just telling you the result, and then I'll tell you how we actually got it. So the answer is, amazingly, that about one in four stars, something like 20% of stars like the sun have a planet that's approximately the size of the Earth in an orbit that is warm like our Earth's orbit. That's a lot of, that's a lot of planets. Um, this result was published by uh, my team in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences just something like two or three weeks ago. The lead author is Eric Pettigura, who's shown here. I, he deserves enormous credit for this work. Eric took on um, what is, was either a, a foolish or an amazing task, which is that he decided to generate a software pipeline to analyze all of the data from Kepler and try to produce a catalog of planets from which we can compute how common Earth-like planets are. Now, mind you that, that NASA has spent a lot of money doing this too. They have teams of computer scientists working on this. Um, Eric's a bright guy and he thought that he could beat them. And um, he, Eric has not done everything that the Kepler team has done, but we have arrived at this historic result. And so let me tell you a little bit more about it. Eric selected 40,000 stars that have characteristics broadly similar to the sun. We call these sun-like stars. For the aficionados in the audience, these are G and K type dwarf stars. And we looked specifically for planets orbiting in the so-called habitable zone of the, these stars. The habitable zone is sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. It's where the, the temperature is just right. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. And just right is technically defined as the region where you could have liquid water on the surface of the planet. We think in our, in our uh, uh, Earth-centric view that liquid water is an absolute prerequisite for life. It sure helped a lot getting life started on our Earth. And so that's why the habitable zone is defined in the way I just described. And so Eric's pipeline, which we call Terra, found 600 and some odd planets orbiting these 40,000 stars. And each dot on this plot represents one of these planets. The axes of these plot, again, and the, the vertical axis are planet size, so the Earth is right here. A planet that's twice the size of the Earth is right here. And now, instead of orbital distance or orbital period, we're plotting these planets as a function of so-called stellar light intensity. This is how much light the planet receives from its star relative to the Earth. So the Earth itself would live right here. A planet that gets 10 times the amount of radiation as the Earth lives right here. And we define the habitable zone as, a, as the set of orbits where the planet gets something like four times the, the amount of uh, light as the Earth does, all the way out to a quarter of the light that the Earth does. And there are people hard at work determining the exact boundaries of the habitable zone. People argue about this uh, quite vociferously. But this is kind of a, a mathematician's definition of the habitable zone and is approximately in the middle of several of the technical definitions. Now, the interesting part of this story and where Keck Observatory fits in is that we have a hard time figuring out where to put these points on this plot. We don't know the exact size of the planets. Kepler only tells us the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. So if we don't know the star, we don't, really don't know the planet. And similarly, we don't know exactly how bright these stars are. So by observing, um, all of the stars essentially on the right-hand side of this diagram, we could tell if these planets were in the habitable zone or if they weren't. And Eric's pipeline called Terra turned up 10 planets that fall in this green box, the habitable zone, um, which is quite, a, quite an, an amazingly large number. Now, one of the things that, that Eric's pipeline is capable of doing is um, something called an injection and recovery test. And this is a common technique in the physical sciences. It's a pretty simple notion. If you have some complicated computer code and it's supposed to discover really rare things, you want to figure out how successful it is at actually just, uh, recovering those rare things. And so Eric's code, you can feed it a synthetic transit and it will tell you if it detected or it, or it didn't. So we know over a broad range of parameters um, how successful Eric's code is at detecting planets. So 
If you want to back out the intrinsic distribution of planets in nature, and not just the distribution of planets that the Kepler telescope discovered, you have to correct for two effects, and this is a little bit of a technical dis uh, description, but I, I know someone in the audience before the talk already asked me about this, so I'm glad I put this slide in to explain it with a little bit of detail. The top shows the perfect scenario where you can actually detect a planet. This is a measurement of the brightness of the star as a function of time, and as the planet passes in front of the star, it dims. A year later, if it's in a year-long orbit, it dims again and again another year later. But this is only for planets that happen to have just the right orbital tilt so that we see the system edge on. If it's tilted a little bit so that the planet doesn't transit, the brightness of the star doesn't change and we don't detect anything at all. So we have to statistically correct for the random distributions of orbital tilts. There are also some stars that are noisy, and these noisy stars do not permit the detection of Earth-sized planets. So here's what one of these light curves might look around a star that's noisy. We simply couldn't detect it. And Eric's injection and recovery pipeline can tell us exactly which stars we can detect the Earth-sized planets around and which ones we couldn't. So if you plot up uh, the efficiency of this pipeline, Terra, at finding planets in this same parameter space, you see that planets that are relatively large and that orbit close to their host star, so they receive a lot of light, if they have the right orbital tilt, the Terra pipeline can detect 100% of them, no problem. These are obvious planets. If they're really small planets and they orbit far from their host star so that you only see a small number of transits, there's no hope and the, the, the uh, detection efficiency is zero. But there's a smooth gradation in between and we can characterize this gradation. And now we have the two key ingredients to figuring out what the true occurrence distribution of planets is. We simply take the uh, distribution that we detected and we uh, invert it using our uh, sensitivity contours. This is where the number, the 22% of sun-like stars having a planet in this box that is having sizes of one to two Earth radii and having uh, receiving an amount of stellar light that is within a factor of four of the amount that the Earth receives. Here's our result again. Um, since this was a, an especially exciting and momentous result, we decided to commission a movie uh, or an animation for this result. So I, since we commissioned it, I can't help but showing it to you. Uh, um, this animation shows that here's the Kepler field. It's between Cygnus and Lyra. If we zoom in through one of the CCDs of Kepler and look at one particular star, we hunted for planets that were in the habitable zone. And as I explained earlier, these planets are not too hot and not too cold. They're just right. The planets that we were looking for, these Earth-sized planets, are one to two times the size of the Earth. And if you took a sample of 20 stars observed by Kepler, four of them would have a planet meeting these important characteristics orbiting them. So this is where we get the number that 20% of sun-like stars have an Earth-like planet in a warm orbit. All right, so let me recap a little bit. We've come a long way uh, in this talk. What have we learned about uh, extrasolar planets? We've learned that planets in general are abundant. We've learned that planetary systems are diverse, their planets range tremendously in their sizes, in their orbits, in their multiplicity. And very recently we've learned that rocky planets, the size of Earth, exist in other solar systems. And finally we've learned that warm planets that are the size of the Earth, potential Earth twins, uh, also exist in other solar systems. Now before I go on to the, the final slide, I should mention one important caveat which is that while we've shown that some planets that are the size of the Earth are rocky and have a, maybe are somewhat like the Earth, in this bottom point here, all we've shown is that the planets are warm and that they're Earth size. There might be other important characteristics that are necessary to the development of life that these planets may not have. For example, some of them may have very thick uh, enveloping atmospheres that choke off life. Nevertheless, if you have 20% of stars like the Sun, and a Milky Way galaxy with billions of stars, we estimate that there's something like 40 billion um, Earth-like planets, according to this definition, in our own Milky Way galaxy. So that's a few Earth-sized planets per human being on Earth. So I'll... <laughs>
Um, I'll close with this um, great video. I showed a little clip of it earlier. This is by Andrew Cooper, who works at Keck Observatory and is in the audience tonight. Uh, and so I believe this video will run for something like uh, two minutes or so. This is um, a night at Keck Observatory, what it's like to actually observe. Thanks very much for having me.